So let's talk about your lab report for the Kinetics Concentration Effects Lab. For page one, you're going to get a lab report form, and that's going to come from the normal URL address that you have on the front page of your syllabus. For page two, you're going to do all of the lab calculations, not sampling, but all of them. And then the next pages are going to be your graphs. They can be on one page or two separate. That's fine with me. Notice that your graph should be the natural log of rate on the y-axis, and don't forget your units, molarity per second, versus your x-axis, which is going to be the natural log of I minus concentration. So that's going to be in molarity. Again, don't forget your units. And of course, we always want a title, so you'll have a title for that as well. When you generate that graph, it's going to be in the negative, negative quadrant, and so it should look like this. That's why I've drawn it just like this, and you'll have a slope that's positive. That's generally what it should look like, both for the natural log concentration of I minus and the hydrogen peroxide graph as well. So make sure that you see that. And then the last page, I want the carbon copy of the data only. Make sure that I can read your data because if I see an error somewhere, I refer back to the data just to check it. That's your lab report. It's due when you come to the next lab. Um, that's also on your syllabus when all of those due dates are. So let's go to the report form. So if we look at the report form, you can see in the left hand corner of this, initial concentrations in the flask of the I minus, the thiosulfate, and of the hydrogen peroxide. Those initial concentrations are what is actually in the flask post dilution. That's very important. So we've got to figure out what's in the flask post dilution. Because when we put these ingredients in, notice we've got water, buffer, potassium iodide starch, sodium thiosulfate, and look at the two lines underneath six mils of the hydrogen peroxide. You should have written down the concentration of hydrogen peroxide from the carboy in the lab. So you have that concentration in your lab notes and you have six mils. The total volume when I add all of those up is 150 mils. It's the same for all four flasks. It's also the same down here. All four flasks have 150 mils. Now notice, for the first part, you're looking at potassium iodide, and as it changes in concentration, what happens to the overall rate? So we're only changing the iodide concentration. In the second part, we are changing the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. Everything else is staying the same. Again, the total volume stays the same. So the only thing that's changing is hydrogen peroxide, and that's why we're wanting to know how does that change in concentration of hydrogen peroxide affect the rate. All right, so for this first one, we're going to calculate the initial concentration of I minus in the flask. Now you might ask, well, it's got potassium. Well, the potassium is a spectator ion. It is not part of the overall reaction. So we've got to calculate that initial concentration. So when we go back to our notes over here, we're going to come back. Let's move forward to that. And we are going to calculate the initial concentration of I minus. That's that column. So in flask 1, the initial concentration was 0 0.30. That's in your lab report information or your lab document information. And according to that, we'll go back and glance at it. See the 0.3 molar pet KI or the 0.3 molar I. We used 2 mils for flask 1. So as a result, that means that what I actually put into the Erlenmeyer was 0 0.0020 liter or 2 mils. And that's going to tell me how many moles of I minus or I died we actually transferred. Now we still need concentration. We want to know what's the concentration after we diluted it in 150 mils. So that means we got to divide by total volume. And we've already noted when we add up all of the ingredients, the volume, we end up with 0 0.150 liter or 150 mils. And this number, when I do that calculation, is going to give me the initial concentration in flask 1 for the iodide. Now the only number that's going to change on all of these is this number because the total volume stays the same, the concentration stays the same. So when we look to flask 2, notice flask 2 has 4 mils in it. Flask 3 has 8 mils. Flask 
4 has 16. So again, the only number that's going to change. So when we do this again, we would bring that down, that concentration down, and we would multiply it by 0 0.0040 liters and so forth. Okay. Again, this is the only number. And it would change by 8 the next time and 16 the next time. And you'll calculate those concentrations. If we go back to that report form, let's get it back down. You'll notice in the report form that we've also got to have the concentration of the thiosulfate and the concentration of hydrogen peroxide initially. So let's figure out what the initial concentration of thiosulfate is in the flask because that's going to help us later. So we're going to come here and we're going to do initial concentration of thiosulfate. So in that flask, it's going to be the same for flask 1 through 4 because it doesn't change. And if we go to the sheet that tells us everything that we've used, you'll see, based on the ingredients, that we used 0 0.020 molar. That sodium goes away because it's a spectator. It doesn't participate. And we have 5 mils that we're using, so 0 0.020. moles of thiosulfate per liter and we've used 5 mils of it or 0 .0050 liters that's going to get me to moles of thiosulfate and of course we've got to divide by total volume we know that the total volume doesn't change because we can add it up and it's 0 .150 liters so when we get that concentration post dilution, we end up with 0 0.00067 molar thiosulfate. You'll do the same for hydrogen peroxide. Again, for that one, you're going to have to go to your lab notebook because your lab notebook will have the concentration that you wrote down from lab today. And then notice two lines under the table, you used six mils of hydrogen peroxide. So you can figure out the concentration initially in the flask. So let's go back to the report form. And when we look at the report form, you can put the time of the clock for the reaction in seconds in the column. For flask one, it was your last to change. So you should see that the longest time is in the first slot and the shortest time is in the fourth slot because the fourth flask went quickly. Now for rate, we've got to do a little bit more thinking about that, how to calculate rate for these reactions. So in terms of rate, let's go back to this initial equation here and look at these two. Now we want to know something about the rate with respect to iodide and hydrogen peroxide. The buffer is there, it just facilitates the reaction, keeps it acidic. But we really want to know how does hydrogen peroxide and iodide affect the rate. So H plus doesn't, so we're not worried about it. We have a second reaction because the first reaction goes so slowly. So really what we did is we have a known thiosulfate and when all of the thiosulfates consumed, so when that thiosulfate, so here's my original thiosulfate concentration. When all of it's consumed, we see a blue color and that blue color is indicative of the iodine in solution or the iodine. So knowing that, that tells us that the I2 is being generated at that point. So we're going to use this, something that we know about, in order to figure out the concentration of I minus, or the change. So all of that thiosulfate, let me say that one more time, when all of this thiosulfate gets consumed, we see the, the presence of I2. So that gives us at least a change in concentration. Because again, remember, when we're talking rate, so if we want to know what the average rate is of this above reaction, and we're changing it with respect to I minus, that's what the rate's dependent upon, I've got to figure out that rate from I minus. And from class, we learned that when we're consuming something, it's negative. And so it'd be negative. We have a two, number two, in front of that iodide, so that's going to be minus one half and that's going to be the change in concentration of iodide over the change in time. So to get rate, we have time because that's, what's in, that's what you did in lab, you collected the time, but we need to figure out how do we get that change in iodide. And we're going to get it from the thiosulfate. 
Now, that means we've got to relate the thiosulfate to my iodide. And notice the thiosulfate, for every two moles of thiosulfate that we consume in the reaction, we also consume one mole of I2. Moreover, if we look at the top reaction, now we've got I2, which is being used in the second reaction. We can relate the I2 to I minus. For every one mole of I2, we consume two moles of I minus. So when we go through this, that tells me that overall, the concentration of iodide, the change in it, and I dropped my moles, let me put that back, is 0 0.00067 moles of iodide per liter. So here is how much was consumed. Now that is actually the amount that we start with. So when we come down here, we can use that information in our rate. So it'd be negative one half, and now we're gonna plug some information in. We've got our change in T that you're gonna add in in seconds. And remember, this is always gonna be final concentration minus initial concentration. So we're gonna use my initial concentration as 0 0.00067 and my initial con or my final concentration rather is going to be zero because I have none left and we're again basing that on the thiosulfate when all of the thiosulfate's gone we have the production of I2 so we're using it and relating it back to I minus and so then we plug in our change in T here so if we had 104 seconds for example for one of them we would be able to then calculate our rate now notice because I've got these negatives they're going to go away and my rate is going to give me a positive value in moles per second once you do that calculation so now that we have that this number right here doesn't change the only thing that's going to change and I'm going to change to colors is your time. So now that we know what the change is for I minus, we're going to change on the bottom the delta T. We've just got to replace that delta T for each one. Now don't forget this minus a half in the front. Now when you go to do the H2O2, you're going to do a similar process for that as well. Now in that one, so we'll go to a different color, we're going to have to take thiosulfate all the way to moles of H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide per liter. And that's going to tell me the amount at which it changed. Now rate based on that is going to be again negative because it's a reactant and it's being consumed. And then we're going to have negative the change. And if you look at it, it's one over one. I'll be a little deliberate. The change in concentration of H2O2 over the change in time. The time is what you collected in lab. So once you get this value here, you can plug it in there and then divide it by time and that's going to give you your rate of that reaction. Again, it should end up being a positive number because your final minus your initial, your zero minus whatever that calculated value is, is going to end up being negative and a negative and a negative makes a positive. So you'll have a positive molarity per second. That's how you're going to calculate rate. It's based on thiosulfate. We had to use the thiosulfate in order to be able to figure out what was going on in the top reaction. So we're looking at an average consumption of that thiosulfate. So then we've got those three, we've got our initial concentration of I minus, we've got our rate, and now we can generate a graph and your graph is going to be natural log of rate versus natural log of I minus and it's going to give you a slope and that slope should be positive. It would probably be a fraction of a number and then with the order of reaction with respect to I minus the slope of that base fit line will give you the order with respect to I minus. The same here, once you generate the slope of your best fit line for natural log of rate versus natural log of concentration of H2H2, H2O2, that is going to also give you the order of the reaction. Now for my lab, I don't want you to do the bottom part, the calculate the rate constant. So X out this bottom part where the K values are. I just want you to do the top part of the lab report. 
and then the rest of the form where you have k values you will not do that out so you'll x out those values so essentially you're only going to do this top section that you can see right now you are not going to do calculate the rate and you should be done with your lab report uh, make sure that everything's nice and neat and legible, that you have computer-generated graphs. Just want to make sure I can follow all your calculations.